Everyone's heard of the game Castle Wolfenstein. Fewer people know that the creator of Wolfenstein developed what is probably the first programming game. This channel has always existed at the intersection of programming languages and old games, so it's only appropriate that I talk about what is, to the best of my knowledge, the first programming-based game, Silas Warner's Robot War. Robot War is a game where you program robots to battle in an arena using a language that bears similarities to both assembly language and forth. As near as I can tell, it's an original invention on the part of the author. But before we get into the game, let's talk a little bit about Silas Warner himself. The man is a legend. Did you ever play a Wolfenstein game? They all draw their inspiration from the original Castle Wolfenstein, a 1981 game on the Apple II. The original Wolfenstein was a fantastic action game for the time, letting you kill Nazis, and in the sequel, Hitler, while escaping with their war plans. The game had randomized layouts for both rooms and treasure, destructible walls, and digitized speech in freaking 1981. Enemy behaviors that could feel shockingly authentic, and it did all this on a machine with only 48k of RAM. Silas Warner himself was an amazing character, a gentle giant, he's been called, who created entire genres of software with a wave of his hand. At Indiana University in the mid-1970s, he discovered the Plato Educational System, a mainframe computer connected to thousands of graphical terminals. He wrote multiple games for Plato, including Empire, Conquest, and an early version of Robot War called Robot Wars. With the advent of the Apple II, Warner's own machine was just the 234th one off the line, Silas founded Muse Software along with Ed Zaron, and Muse began publishing successful games. One of the earliest was a 3D maze game called Escape, which was one of the inspirations for Richard Garriott's 3D dungeons in Akalabeth and Ultima. Warner was always trying new things. One of the most vivid memories I have of his games is Firebug. See, the Apple II had several graphics modes. Almost every game used the high-res graphics mode, which was detailed for the time, but somewhat slow and had very weird color artifacting. For Firebug, Warner decided to make an action game using only the low-res mode, which was much more colorful than the high-res alternative. It's one of only a handful of major publisher games that uses the mode that I can think of. And it's a pretty good game besides. Check out that fire. Robot War is amazing on the surface because the idea of a programming language game on the Apple II is amazing. But it goes beyond that. There's a lot going on here for an 8-bit computer in 1981. You've got the programming language itself, and the VM that these robots run that programming language in, you have what amounts to a small assembler to make those programs runnable. You have a simulator where multiple robots are executing at the same time, and you even have a full screen editor in which to write the programs. There were actual development systems for assembly language in 1981 that did not have full screen editors. In fact, this full screen editor was sold separately as a word processor by Muse. The manual goes into some detail about the robots you're programming. Each one is on tracks, able to move both horizontally and vertically. Each robot has a radar dish that can be aimed in any direction, and will tell you the distance to any robots it's pointed at. And each robot has one gun that can be swiveled in any direction, that fired shells on a timed fuse. The gun has infinite ammunition, but it does have a cooldown period between each shot. And most importantly, each robot has a computer. So with all of that in mind, let's take a look at Robot War and take a look at the actual language. 
and see how that looks. So we come here to the main menu. You can see we have a number of options, including starting a battle, testing a robot, turning the sound on and off. I'm going to choose Edit Robot Source Code. All right, so let's make a very simple robot. This robot is just going to try to seek the upper left corner and then scan everything from its right on downward and then reset the scan. It's not going to respond to getting shot. Um, if an unexpected obstacle in the, is in the way, it's just going to bump into it. So first of all, we're in the screen editor. The solid blinking cursor means that we're in kind of a mode similar to the VI editor where we can move around. We hit Control A to get into insert mode. Uh, now that we're in insert mode, we could start typing. And so I'm going, oops, I don't know if this requires caps locks, but I think it does. So let's turn on caps lock and then start typing. So if you just type something along the left margin, that's going to be a label. I'm going to put that label there, even though I'm not sure I need it. Um, so the first thing I said we were going to do is go to the upper left. For simplicity, let's do that in two steps. First, we'll go to the left wall. The arena is about 256 by 256. So we're going to move fairly quickly uh, in the negative direction, which is left. Zero zeros in the upper left. We're going to take that negative 140 and we're going to store it in the speed X register, which will start our robot moving left. And then we will check to see if we are close to the wall. And if we are, we're going to go to another label that we have not yet defined. Uh, if we are not near the wall, then we just want to kind of spin here. There's probably patterns that are better than this. This is actually very inefficient because it's going to continually restore the same speed and the same register, use instructions, but I'm not worried about that for, for a test robot. So then we're going to define our next label here. We're going to do the exact same thing that we did before, only this time we know we are no longer looking to go left. So we are going to stop our horizontal motion and start our vertical motion. I kind of suspect that this is fast enough that we're actually going to slam into a wall rather than uh, gently touch it. But my robot's tough. Glorious Soviet robot can take it. Okay, so we're going to do a similar thing where we're, if we're out of this loop, we're going to stop our vertical motion. And let's use some of these general purpose registers. So let's say, I don't know, um, 10 degrees seems like a, a reasonable scan for a 40 for 90 degree angle. I don't want these to be too small. And if we're in the corner, my theory is that if we're in the corner, we got a pretty good chance of find, catching one of our enemies in the radar. And we're going to use this um, to uh, figure out when to stop. We want to stop when we're scanning at 180 degrees, which is pointed straight down. It's kind of a compass rose type situation in terms of the directions. Okay, so that with that set up, we're going to make a new label that we're going to jump to later for a loop. And we're going to say first, if our aim is greater than our final aim, 180 in this case, store the value 10, reinitialize the I register, basically. Um, nope, sorry, that's actually going to be wrong. I think we want to go back to. Yeah, we want 80 degrees to be stored in the aim register. We want to reset. Then we're going to do a little addition here. We're going to take 80 plus our increment to aim. So the first time through the loop, we should be aiming 90 degrees straight right. We take our aim value and we send it to the radar register. I always, I looked at this in 1981, 1982, and I found this syntax for assignment uh, blah to blah to be very confusing. I wanted it to be, you know, x equals 6, and instead it's 6 to x, which is why I described it as somewhat fourth-like. So then let's say 
So if radar is um, zero, that means that nothing was detected, which I don't think is actually possible. If radar is positive, it means you detected a wall. And if radar is negative, it means you detected a robot. So this robot isn't going to do anything clever if it uh, finds a wall. It's only going to do something clever if it finds a robot. So if there's a robot in our radar, we're going to just shoot at it. And so the way you shoot is you say the distance that you want to shoot. So if a robot is, say, 50 units away from us, the radar register is going to contain negative 50. So we need to change that negative 50 to positive 50. We're going to do that by 0 minus radar to shot, or 0 minus radar, which is going to negate the radar number. And then we're assigning it to the shot register, which is actually going to fire our explosive bullet. Um, I would love to use parentheses, but I do not believe this language has any kind of parentheses or even really um, complicated associativity. So, okay, so now we've taken our shot. We want to go on to the next aim point. Right, so we're going to make, instead of having 10 in I on our next time through this loop, we'll have 17 and then 24, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to just loop forever and uh, hopefully not get killed. So I'm going to hit escape, escape, two escapes. Um, the cursor keys are a little bit weird um, if you've never used an Apple II before. So you use the left and right arrows, like you would think. And the Apple II and I believe the II Plus did not have up and down arrow keys. So you use the enter key or the return key to go up and the slash to go down. And this seems really, really weird to modern users, but it actually made sense if you saw uh, the way an Apple II keyboard was laid out. And now I think I understand why I had 80 plus I to I. It's because I is what I actually, uh, actually was mutating. So I think I want to fix that before we compile this, or rather, excuse me, assemble this. All right, I think this is, I don't know if it's right, but let's find out. I'm going to hit Control S. Let me type a name to save this. Let's see how this works. Okay, so now that we've saved it, we can assemble the robot, which I'm going to do by hitting Control R. We wait for the disk drive to think about it a little bit. It's going to ask me if I want to print it out on paper like some sort of animal, but I do not. We then assemble. We can see we've got four labels, five references, 38 instructions, and 304 letters. I don't know what the maximum size of it could be. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's in the manual. I just don't recall the number. Let's go ahead and put our tea leaves robot on the battlefield and see how this battle plays out one of the more advanced robots, I'm going to pick two of the less talented robots. I'm going to pick Bottom, whose strategy is similar to our corner robot. It just seeks the bottom and then kind of moves back and forth. And I'm going to choose Random. Uh, I haven't actually looked at Random's source code, but I assume it's going to be not that great of a robot. I think uh, having these two bad robots here is enough, so let's hit Escape and see how terribly we did. We've got our three robots. Tea Leaves is there uh, in the upper right quadrant. And Bottoms in the middle. Oh, Tea Leaves immediately starts moving fairly quickly for the left wall, which is what we wanted it to do. Ooh, he's right in the bottom sights, so this might not work out that well. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Bottom's going to take a shot. Tea Leaves is moving up a little. We took a little. He winged us. Took a little bit damage, but not that much. A slightly bigger problem is that looking at Tea Leaves' radar, we can see we've made a grievous error somehow, because that robot is only scanning up and not to the right. So we did something wrong with our aim. Let's go back to the lab and see if we can fix that. Looking at the source code, you probably saw my bug before I saw it which is that I changed the wrong line when I changed this from aim to eye. And so we were essentially 
dealing with an uninitialized variable. We never put anything in the aim register. So what we actually want to do here is make sure we initialize the aim register and then just reset i on this line. Once again, t leaves is at the top. That's nice. Let's move it to the left. That's what we wanted. The other two robots bumped into each other. I'll take it. Very nice. It actually stopped in time. It did not slam into the wall. Our gun is pointed to the right, which is good, and it looks like it's rotating. So you get a sense for the execution speed here. Each line of code in Robot War is actually precious. Lines of code are time. Ooh, and bottom has a line on us. We just took a shot at random. Solid hit. But actually, we do have another bug, which is that we are not going back, or it doesn't look to me like we are fully resetting our aim to 90 degrees. Despite that, we're doing pretty well. Probably going to take another hit from bottom here. Now, it looks like Random's at 100% damage, so I don't know why he's up. Oh, he just blew up. Random actually walked into a wall and uh, blew itself up. We're going to take another shot here. I think we're st we might eke this out through pure luck. I have to tell you, we did not make a great robot here. We've done that. Bottom's coming back for another swing at uh, tea leaves. Tea leaves. Tea leaves radar is a bit erratic, not do performing at the level expected of a pro robot. Oh, a solid hit, and tea leaves ekes out the win. That was a squeaker. Robot War would go on to inspire many other programming games on nearly every platform. Silas Warner passed away in 2004 after a long-term battle with kidney disease, leaving behind a loving wife. But his legacy lives on in his games and in the games they inspired. The next time you play a programming game, take a moment and think of Silas.